Today we'll begin a discussion of chapter 24 on nutrition and metabolism from our human anatomy and physiology text. <clears throat> nutrition is the study or the observation of everything that you ingest or consume in your body into your GI tract. Most of what we ingest uh, is called macronutrients. Those are the proteins, carbohydrates, and fats that we consume in our diet that's used for energy and building cellular materials, connective tissue, and so forth. <clears throat> it's often described in terms of its energy value, uh, how much energy is stored in the bonds when you oxidize or break down those chemicals, what we, we get out, and it's, it's given in kilocalories. How much energy it will take to, uh, kilocalories, how much energy it takes to raise one kilogram of water, one degree centigrade. Um, <clears throat> Essential nutrients, when you see that throughout this discussion, it's going to be about things that your body can't synthesize that must be provided in the diet. <clears throat> There's been a lot of research lately on, um, on diet and on nutrition and health, and um, the overall take-home message from recent uh, studies in the last decade or so is that reducing the amount you eat, having a slightly low-calorie diet, being hungry for a fraction of the time uh, will lead to longer uh, life and also less uh, chronic diseases as you go through life. <clears throat> Here's a little cartoon that you may have seen. The U.S. government uh, um, gets sequesters information from expert nutritionists and biologists and, and health professionals and tries to establish what it is that's best to eat. Now, it may seem like what you should eat is just a almost a, a crap shoot because of so much stuff you hear in the media, but it's actually not that complicated and it's not that mysterious and it's not that up in the air. There's a lot of advertising of, of diet plans and, and nutrition plans by people who are trying to make a living by giving advice in there. Um, they may um, be a little bit um, renegade. But anyway, here's just a general scheme of approximately how much relatively you should eat of different uh, classes of foods to be healthy. <clears throat> There's another thing that the government likes to post that just uh, gives you a feeling. This is awfully simplistic, so you, you guys are probably a little above and beyond this sort of thing. But it gives you a feeling for a rough idea about what you should, how much you should eat in a bowl. So let's take a look at the um, macronutrients just briefly, and then we'll look at them in a little more detail later. Carbohydrates. Um, the type of carbohydrates we generally take in our diet are in the form of glucose or other simple sugars, glucose, galactose, or fructose, or disaccharides. When, um, as we see down here at the bottom, um, sugar cane uh, is disaccharides. It's glucose and galactose units in pairs. Um, glucose and fructose, I should say. Lactose uh, is the milk sugar that has glucose and galactose together in pairs. So <clears throat> you take in sugar, Glucose is, uh, and these sugars are used for making ATP. The other major source of ATP uh, uh, fuel is fat. Fatty acids are used to make ATP. So anyway, you take in either um, take in glucose or sugars for making energy in the form of, of simple sugars or disaccharides or starch. Starch is a polymer of glucose molecules, long chains, branch chains of, of glucose molecules that are created by plants, and are we can digest that and and take in the sugars into our blood and use them for fuel. Um, fiber, when we say fiber, we're talking about polymers of glucose produced by plants that we cannot digest with our pancreatic enzymes, cellulose largely. <clears throat> so we can't digest cellulose ourselves, yeah, but it produces some important bulking agent in the, in the digestive tract and has all kinds of healthful effects. So they want, they want us to eat quite a bit of fiber, lots of fruits and vegetables every meal. Um, it turns out that the bacteria in your intestines can digest cellulose, and so um, they produce short-chain fatty acids from the cellulose as they break it down, and those fatty acids are then absorbed into your blood and can produce up, upwards of 15% of your, your calories per day. So the bacteria really help us out with that. <clears throat> lipids, the two sources, the two types of lipids that are really important are triglycerides, Three fatty acids connected to a glycerol molecule. That's what we call fat. And cholesterol. Cholesterol is a 
kind of specialized looking uh, molecule with several rings, organic ring structures. Um, a couple of important essential fatty acids are linoleic acid and linolenic acid. So triglycerides are made of these long carbon chains. Fatty acids are tetrad. Okay. <laughs> um, so those are just two essential fatty acids, ones that you need for for your cellular metabolism, but that you can't synthesize in your own body. It has to come from the diet. <clears throat> your liver, incidentally, can make cholesterol from scratch, so that's not an essential nutrient. And in fact, the liver makes about 85% of all the cholesterol that's handled by your body on a daily basis. Um, <clears throat> what are lipids used for? Lipids have a lot of important functions. Um, they help us absorb fat-soluble vitamins, for one thing. Sorry for all the background noise. Um, fatty acids are the other major fuel. In fact, the, the, the major fuel for liver cells and muscle cells for energy production. Glucose is good for the nervous system and for any cell. And fatty acids can be used by these other cells, by muscle, skeletal muscle and heart and so forth. So they're a really important fuel source. Um, phospholipids make up all of your cell membranes trillions of cells in your body, right? We need a lot of phospholipids. Uh, myelin sheaths of your neurons are all made of phospholipids, layers and layers of phospholipids. Um, adipose tissue we've studied before. What's the, the we talked studied connective tissues, importance of that uh, structures in your body. Prostaglandins are some lipid substances that are produced on demand during um, tissue injury and inflammation. Um, they, they are inflammatory in the same way essentially as histamine. So you can add that to your repertoire of, of um, signaling molecules you know about in your body. Um, <clears throat> cholesterol, it's a bad rap in our culture, right? You hear cholesterol, the word cholesterol, you think bad, don't eat it, bad to have in your diet. Uh, as we said, the liver will make all the cholesterol you need no matter what you eat, and so it really isn't that important. The amount of cholesterol in your blood at any given time is more genetically determined. There's a few other um, issues there or, or uh, factors that affect cholesterol in your blood, but largely genetic. Anyway, um, cholesterol is found in all your cells' membranes. It controls the fluidity of the lipid bilayer and thereby the movement of membrane proteins in the, in the membrane, and that's important. So there's, you need cholesterol that needs to be distributed throughout your body on a regular basis. Proteins. <clears throat> proteins, is the, that's the structural material of your body. Your cytoskeleton, your cells, that's the structural scaffolding that makes up the integrity of your cells. Um, connective tissue, collagen, there's more collagen than anything else in your, any other protein in your body. That's in the bones and, and cartilage and connective tissue proper. And uh, so there's lots and lots of cartilage, or um, sorry, collagen protein. So anyway, we take in protein from animal sources or from uh, beans and nuts and grains, and, uh, and we use that protein to build our own cellular materials, right? We can make that collagen and make all those and the keratin intermediate filaments. We can make all the cytoskeleton, other cytoskeleton skeletal elements, actin and myosin and tubulin and so forth. Enzymes, all the enzymes that catalyze the chemical reactions in your cells are proteins. And finally, uh, when we break down proteins, what do we get? Amino acids. And amino acids can be used to build other proteins, or they can actually be used for fuel, but they're not a normal fuel source. We will not consider them as a fuel source, even though we do have the metabolic capability. Um, when you think about proteins and what they're kind of, how they're composed, they have amine groups in them. Amino acids uh, are the building blocks, and, and amines are, are compounds that have organic compounds with nitrogen in there. And so when we talk about uh, metabolism of protein, we often talk about nitrogen balance. If you're in positive balance, now that's true for any nutrient, positive balance means you're taking in or utilizing more than you're, you're um, getting rid of in your body. So positive nitrogen balance means we're, we're building protein using the amino acids from our diet more than we're excreting uh, amino acids in, 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 or in, in the form of nitrogen compounds, um, right? We excrete them in the form of urea and so forth. So uh, positive balance building Negative balance means we're breaking down protein in the body faster than we're taking in protein in the diet. And there's a number of things that can lead to breakdown of proteins. Cle or cortisol is a protein breakdown kind of signaling hormone. Um, various kinds of pathologies can lead to um, negative protein balance. Take, not taking in enough dietary protein is going to lead to negative protein balance.
<clears throat> um, hormonal controls of, of protein balance, um, steroids, anabolic steroid hormones, such as um, testosterone and estrogen to an extent. Um, those are the hormones that promote protein synthesis. Growth hormone promotes protein synthesis. Um, adrenal glucocorticoids, as I just mentioned, cortisol promotes protein breakdown, glucocorticoids. This slide just shows <clears throat> that some of the amino acids that we use, that all our cells use every day to make proteins, are essential. Eight essential amino acids are shown over here on the right here in this column. And um, another point of this illustration is to show you that there's no one plant source that has all eight, um, or there are not too many plant sources that have all eight, I should say. Uh, soybeans do have all eight of the essential amino acids, but most plant sources do not. You simply, if you're, if you're on a vegetarian diet, you simply need to do your homework so that you know what combination of, of plant sources can produce, can give you all eight of those essential amino acids. The rest you can synthesize for yourself. How much do you need? Well, it turns out that in the average American diet, we take in way more protein than we need, so you don't really need to consider that. There's 99% chance that you're taking in way more protein than you actually need. You need 0 0.8 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight per day. Uh, that is not very much. You need a lot more than you eat, more than one meal typically out of the free. Anyway, even if you're a, an elite athlete, a power lifter, a bodybuilder, the most you need is 2 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight per day. So not a horribly large amount. <clears throat> Vitamins. What are vitamins? Well, vitamins are what we call coenzymes or cofactors oftentimes. Um, enzymes catalyze specific chemical reactions in your cells, and vitamins are often needed by those enzymes to help them out with the process of converting the substrates into products, and so they're called, often called coenzymes. Um, <clears throat> some vi vitamin D can be synthesized in your skin and your kidneys first in the skin, then finished up in the kidneys. Some vitamins are taken up by uh, in your intestines from the action of bacteria that can produce some B vitamins and vitamin K uh, and so forth. Um, anyway, um, baby hush. There we go again with the background noise. That's Milo, the, chip, the corgi. He barks a lot. So we need to take in all the vitamins besides the ones listed here besides vitamin D, some of the B vitamins and K and vitamin A that can be um, um, produced in our bodies. Um, there's two types of vitamins, water-soluble vitamins. The B vitamins and vitamin C um, comprise most of the water-soluble vitamins. They're need for, needed for a whole bunch of metabolic processes. We tend to get way more vitamins in our diet than we need because many of the foods we eat are supplemented with vitamins, it's just a thing that's been kind of promoted by probably the Food and Drug Administration and various agencies in the government to promote public health, maintain the health of our population. So, but um, it's popular culturally to take way, way, way more of vitamins oftentimes. If some is good, more is better is the logical. It really isn't true. You're just wasting your money and wasting um, materials when you eat vitamins in excess. They just get excreted. <clears throat> fast soluble vitamins, vitamins A, D, E, and K, and are absorbed, as we said, with lipids in your diet. Vitamin A uh, is important for producing um, 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 rhodopsin in your, in your retinas, in the photoreceptors in your retinas, among other things. Vitamin D is needed for taking up calcium from the intestines from your diet. Vitamin E is an antioxidant. And there's lots of reactive oxygen species we'll mention in a bit that are produced during metabolism of oxygen, poisonous stuff, and you need some antioxidants to, to get rid of those reactive oxygen species and, and other free radicals. Vitamin K, as we said uh, recently, is needed by your liver to produce the, the blood clotting factors. Liver produces most of the plasma proteins, including the clotting factors, and those have some specialized uh, organic chemical moieties that uh, require vitamin K. Vitamins C, E, and A are good antioxidants along with the, the trace mineral selenium or selenium. Um, so again, we have um, free radicals being produced during exercise and during oxygen metabolism, and we need some, some 
some compounds to counteract them so they don't do damage. Their, mo their molecules are so reactive, they damage proteins and nucleic acids in cells, and that requires, it's wasted energy, requires repair, synthesis and repair. There are, there are antioxidant chemicals in your cells, so your cells have other uh, ways of dealing with, with uh, oxygen radicals. <clears throat> Some minerals. There are minerals that we need in, in fairly significant amounts, and there are minerals that we need only in very tiny, tiny amounts called trace minerals, but they're still important nonetheless. Calcium, obviously we need that for the extracellular matrix of bone, as well as it's an important signaling ion. In, in virtually all cells, when calcium levels in the cytoplasm go up, some really exciting things are going to happen, such as muscle contraction or and, um, neurotransmitter exocytosis. Phosphate, phosphorus is, a, is, uh, is converted into phosphates, and phosphates are part of the extracellular matrix of bone. Phosphates, uh, pho phosphate, phosphorus again being the starting point for making phosphates, Phosphates are attached to proteins oftentimes that act as a switch to turn on and off the function of proteins in our cells. It's called phosphorylation and dephosphorylation. Oftentimes if a phosphate group gets put on a protein in a particular position by an enzyme, that will turn on the activity of that protein, whatever it normally does. Potassium is so important. Uh, it's, it's important as an intracellular cation. It's the major intracellular cation or positive ion, and it, and it, and it is what by as it leaves the cells through potassium channels, repolarizes uh, muscle cells and neurons. It's super important to have plenty of potassium. Um, sulfur is important uh, in links between um, parts of, of protein chains so the proteins can fold up into a specific uh, shape and then disulfide bonds. Sulfurs between pairs of amino acids often link together parts of the protein to hold it in place. Sodium. Sodium is, is the prevalent solute, the most prevalent solute in, in the body fluids. It's about 150 millimolar uh, sodium or milli uh, equivalents of sodium per liter of fluid. So a lot of sodium ions out there, <clears throat> right? It's necessary for action potentials among other things. Um, chloride ions, the counter ion to sodium is a, it's an anion, a negatively charged ion. There's probably about 25 millimolar uh, chloride ions. So together those make about a about a hundred, um, no, not 25, what am I saying? Probably closer to a hundred. So um, a lot of, a lot of solute is sodium chloride in your body fluids. Magnesium, uh, if you look back in your book to the area where it talks about long-term potentiation in, in conduction at, um, at chemical synapses in the nervous system, you'll see that magnesium is mentioned in controlling the um, calcium channels of NMDA channels. Neurons that are involved in long-term potentiation and, and memory formation have these NMDA channels that are activated by uh, glutamate, but uh, magnesium is important in those, in those NMDA channels for controlling the, the entry of calcium into the cells by, uh, by those channels. Um, lots of other trace minerals that are needed. Um, oh, who knows, molybdenum, selenium, arsenic. There's various metals that are needed by in small, small amounts by certain enzymes in your body that need those iron atoms to have their uh, functional groups, their active sites to, catap to catalyze the reactions that they work on. <clears throat> so we have to make sure that the intake equals excretion of all of the substances we're talking about, all these minerals, all the nutrients except macronutrients, much, many of the macronutrients are consumed for energy production, but all, all these, um, these minerals have to remain constant in your body. Whatever you take in must be excreted to maintain constant levels in your body. Uh, one other one we didn't mention in the other slide, iron, obviously important for making hemoglobin. Each hemoglobin complex has four iron uh, atoms, and that's the, that's the oxygen binding site, so it's so critical. Iodine is needed for um, synthesizing thyroid hormone. So a couple ones we didn't mention before. Um, some mineral rich foods, um, legumes again, um, are very good for many, many reasons, but, but that's one that they have protein in them. They also have lots of minerals. Legumes are, they grow in the ground. And, uh, and so they are in contact with those minerals that are in the ground and they, and they collect those minerals. Okay, let's talk about metabolism. Metabolism 
is a, is a title given to the sum, the collection of all the chemical reactions that your that can your cells can undergo. Cells have, are filled with enzymes and enzymes catalyzing reactions. All the reactions together are called metabolism, but the building type reactions are called anabolism, taking simpler molecules and making more complex molecules out of them. Uh, and catabolism is taking more complex molecules and breaking them down into simpler ones. So the, the general scheme is that we're going to take in complex macromolecules in your diet, macronutrients, bring them into your body, and break them down in cellular respiration into smaller molecules, essentially CO2 and water, and, but it doesn't all catabolism doesn't have to be cellular respiration. But anyway, we break them down, extract some energy out, capture it, and then use that energy to drive anabolism, building the things that our cells want. So we take in macromolecules, uh, oxidize them, break them down, catabolism, use that energy that we, that we that's released to undergo anabolism. So cellular respiration. <clears throat> Chemical reactions in your cells that are used to produce ATP energy. And that's our storage form, uh, one of the major storage forms of energy in your cells, adenosine triphosphate. <clears throat> so again, we catabolize food molecules, and then we, we, as we break them down, we get energy out and we store it as ATP. Then we take that energy and use it to drive cellular processes. Uh, again, phosphorylation is, uh, is a way of storing energy. If you have ADP, adenosine diphosphate, and phosphorylate it, you'll have adenosine triphosphate, adding a phosphate group on there. But you can also phosphorylate proteins. That's how we regulate a lot of proteins and their function. So the goal of cellular respiration is to break down fuel molecules, oxidize fuel molecules, and capture the energy and store it in the form of ATP uh, so that we can use that to drive all cellular processes. There's multiple sets of chemical reactions involved in cellular respiration. First, glycolysis, a series of 10 chemical reactions, so you're starting with glucose. Then Krebs cycle in the mitochondria. So right here, we're jumping into the mitochondria and then oxidative phosphorylation or utilizing what we call the electron transport chain. So here's a wonderful big picture schematic diagram of metabolism and rest cellular respiration. So awesome. <clears throat> In fact, it's talking about um, uh, digestion and, and absorption and all the nine things. All right, proteins come into the body. They're digested down to amino acids, come into the blood, become available to all the cells, and we make proteins out of them. Anabolism. So catabolism, anabolism. Uh, it takes energy to build those proteins, and some of the energy comes from fuel molecules like carbohydrates. Catabolism. We break down complex carbohydrates like starch into glucose and other sugars, and we bring those into the blood, and your cells can use those sugars for glycolysis. Glycolysis is, the, is that 10 step process I was just talking about that produces pyruvic acid. So glucose to pyruvic acid plus CO2 plus some ATP. We'll get some energy out of that and some high energy electrons. And then we'll produce acetyl-CoA from the pyruvic acid if we have some oxygen hanging around. And then the acetyl-CoA can go down in the Krebs cycle and into the mitochondria. Down in the light blue is mitochondria. Up here in the top is the cytoplasm. So now we got Krebs cycle churning. And that's going to produce a bunch more high energy electrons. The last, the last two carbons here from our glucose molecule are going to go off as CO2, but we're going to get some high energy electrons. This blue ball represents a hydrogen atom with high energy electrons. We're going to send that into the, in the electron transport chain and produce lots of ATP. That method of producing ATP is called oxidative phosphorylation. Ultimately, all those electrons, once they're used up in this electron transport chain, have to have somewhere to go to get rid of them by combining them with oxygen molecules and height, those hydrogen atoms we had to start with and forming brand new water molecules. Okay, so that's where a lot of our energy comes from. Um, cellular respiration starting with carbohydrates and then we can use the ATP to drive protein synthesis over here. Um, fats, triglycerides, we bring them into the body. Catabolism, we break them down to fatty acids and glycerol. That's what you get when you're breaking the fat down. Um, then we can store that in our own body as an energy uh, reservoir in the form of adipose tissue fat. We can also take fatty acids and oxidize those, and the way they enter into the picture is as acetyl-CoA. 
Oxidation of fatty acids produces acetyl-CoA, which goes right into the Krebs cycle in the mitochondria. Boom, we get a whole bunch of ATP out. In fact, as much as 54 ATPs per fatty acid as compared to around 32 ATPs per glucose molecule when all is said and done. Um, <clears throat> glycerol can be used to actually make glucose. If we're in a pinch and we need more glucose, we can do gluconeogenesis. Uh, I hope you remember that term from uh, muscle tissue and from um, uh, endocrinology, chapter 16. All right. All the reactions, like say in the electron transport chain, but many of the reactions of cellular respiration are what, what are called redox reactions. There's oxidation of one molecule, meaning losing electrons, so there's oxidizing, oxidizing glucose molecules, losing electrons. Those high energy electrons that come out when we break the bonds are captured to be used later to make ATP. That's called oxidation. So what, where do those electrons go? We have to capture them. They're taken up by another molecule that's called reduction. So when we oxidize fuel molecules, we have to reduce another molecule such as NAD or FAD. That's what those are. They're just carrier molecules to capture those electrons, and that's called reduction. And then they can go on and reduce a, a molecule in the electron transport chain by giving up those electrons. They, in turn, then become oxidized. So oxidizing, loss of, react, loss of electrons, reduction, gain of electrons. Those reactions work together. They're coupled. When one molecule loses electrons, they're captured by another one. That's what allows these reactions to proceed. Electrons can't just go floating off into water. The reactions won't happen unless there's somebody around that can take up those electrons. So what are we going to do? We're going to make ATP using all the energy that we have extracted by oxidation of our fuels. And there's two ways to think about making ATP substrate level phosphorylation and oxidative phosphorylation. So you may have noticed that in glycolysis, 10 chemical reactions, we get out a couple of ATPs. Krebs cycle, we get out a couple of ATPs. That's called substrate level phosphorylation. A couple of the reactions during those processes, those multi-step processes of breaking down glucose molecules, for example, yield ATPs where we're taking a phosphate group and sticking it onto an ADP to make ATP. And that's going to be released, so we get some actual energy out of the out of this this set of reactions called glycolysis, and that substrate level phosphorylation. Right here's the substrate, here's an enzyme, and it's popping on phosphate and making ATP. Um, the other, the major way we make ATP is by chemiosmosis. There's so many nicknames: oxidative phosphorylation, electron transport system. Uh, all this stuff is happening in the mitochondria. And we're going to make lots and lots of ATP molecules, like come like like water out of a fire hose, essentially, by comparison. Let's see what's going to happen here. We're going to pump hydrogen ions. The electron transport chain, as we'll see in a bit, is designed to pump hydrogen ions into the space between two layered membranes of the mitochondria. There's two membranes, an inner and outer membrane, and in the space in between, we use the energy from the high energy electrons to pump hydrogen ions in there. Right, that's what this purple thing is. We pump hydrogen ions in here and they accumulate and form a concentration gradient. Not so many down here in the inner part of the mitochondria, lots in this space. There should be another membrane drawn right up here. All right, so what happens when you have a gradient, you have diffusion, these hydrogen ions are going to push their way through this pink machine. It's the coolest thing ever. It's a protein machine that can actually mechanically, somehow, chemical and chemically and mechanically produce ATP from ADP. So there's not a one-to-one -one correspondence between high energy electrons and ATP synthesis. We're just going to run these proton pumps. A proton is just a hydrogen ion, another nickname for it. Proton equals hydrogen ion. So we're going to pump these H ions, these H pluses, out into the space. When they accumulate out here, they're going to drive their way back through, down through this ATP synthase and produce ATPs. That's called chemiosmosis uh, or oxidative phosphorylation. <clears throat> All right, let's look a little closer at um, oxidation of glucose. Um, here's what we got. We start out with a glucose molecule. That's what this is. And then we oxidize it right down through all those three sets of reactions we just talked about and produce 32 ATPs per glucose plus heat. Here's a number that's good to know. Two-thirds of the energy 
released by oxidizing that glucose. It's released as heat. About one third of it is used to produce these ATPs. Let's look a little closer at these of these parts of the cellular respiration process. So <clears throat> glycolysis is taking place in the cytoplasm of the cell. We take a glucose molecule and produce pyruvic acid. Pyruvic acid is converted to acetyl-CoA, as we said, which goes into the mitochondria. We also, from glycolysis, get some high-energy electrons, and we store them, capture them in the form of NADH. NADH then can go into the mitochondria, and we use those electrons in there. Um, when we have <coughs> that pyruvic acid going into the, into the mitochondria, or acetyl-CoA coming from fatty acids, it drives the Krebs cycle, which produces lots and lots of ATP, and also lots of, um, or a little bit of ATP by substrate level phosphorylation, lots and lots of high energy electrons. So we get electrons from glycolysis, electrons from Krebs cycle, and we enter them into the, into the electron transport chain and get lots and lots of ATPs, 32 ATPs per glucose, 54 or so ATPs from fatty acids. I say or so because not all fatty acids are the same length and are the same composition. So that's like a, another way of looking at the big picture of cellular respiration, what's going on with this process, these processes. <clears throat> One thing to mention about glycolysis, going back here, you know, taking glucose and, and, and breaking it stepwise down to form pyruvic acid. Sometimes we can't really bring the pyruvic acid into the, into the mitochondria in the form of, of acetyl-CoA. It might be a muscle cell that doesn't have that many mitochondria, in which case, what are we going to do? We just need to keep doing glycolysis over and over when we don't really have much option with the mitochondria. We do what's called fermentation. We said we capture, during glycolysis, we capture electrons and protons in the form of NADH. Right? We start with NAD, we capture those electrons and protons. Um, we can't use it over again when it's in this form. we got to get rid of those electrons. And so if we're just doing glycolysis all by itself, that's called anaerobic respiration. We will need to give back those hydrogen ions and uh, and, and electrons someplace, we put them onto uh, pyruvate to form a lactic acid. So fermentation uh, gets rid of the electrons, and, and in this case, we're producing lactic acid. Krebs cycle, that's what happens in the mitochondria. I'm going to skip over these slides, which just say in words what we're going to see in this cartoon. Um, <clears throat> here's the Krebs cycle. We take a pyruvic acid from glycolysis, bust off another CO2, and, and, and now we have acetyl-CoA, we form acetyl-CoA, and we also capture high energy electrons. Acetyl-CoA delivers a two carbon molecule into the Krebs cycle, and the Krebs cycle goes around through a series of a cycle, cyclical series of reactions, coming back to the same starting molecule, oxaloacetic acid, and we release a whole bunch of, of high energy electrons. I drew little ovals around all the places where we get high energy electrons out of Krebs cycle, Remember, we got some from glycolysis. We also do produce a little bit of AT, ATP by substrate level phosphorylation, as you see here. <clears throat> and then we take all those electrons from glycolysis, from uh, oxidation of, of uh, pyruvate to acetyl-CoA, and from Krebs cycle, and here's what we do. We deliver those hot-to-the-touch energy-containing electrons to this series of proteins in the inner membrane of the mitochondria. So this is the outer membrane of the mitochondria. This is like another membrane inside of that. And so we deliver the electrons to these chain, this chain of, of proteins, and these are redox reactions. We're going to add, we're going to take away the electrons from NAD, NADH, I should say, so it's going to uh, become oxidized, and it's going to reduce this protein here. And this protein happens to be a proton pump. And, and so the, when all the energy hits that proton pump from those electrons, it, it pumps hydrogen ions out into the space. And we take what we lose some energy from the electrons, but they're not quite down to ground zero yet. We still got some energy left and we'll pass those electrons on to the next um, chain protein in the electron transport chain, which is another pump, which the energy level of, of the electrons will go down some more. And we'll use that energy to pump hydrogen ions out into the space and so forth. So you can see this, that's what we call the electron transport chain. Redox reactions happening as the electrons go from protein to protein to protein. We pump lots of hydrogen ions out here. The hydrogen ions drive their way through ATP synthase and produce ATP, lots of it. 
Another way of thinking about the electron transport chain is here. This is just another illustration of what this cartoon is. It's showing the electron transport chain components in a stair stairway kind of illustration. And, and on the left-hand side of this graph is energy. How much free energy do, uh, does the, do the electrons have at each stage of the electron transport chain? You bring them in from NADH and they're hot. And then each time we transfer them, another redox reaction takes place. They lose some more of their energy. And, and so their, their energy level goes lower and lower and lower until finally we, we combine those electrons with oxygen to, and with hydrogen ions, hydrogen to produce water. <clears throat> There's yet another cartoon of the ATP synthase. Hydrogen ions pushing their way down through because of a gradient height in between the membranes low inside the inner mitochondrial uh, space and driving ATP synthase, forming ATP. Boy, we got a lot of cartoons showing the same thing, but there's something new on this slide. It's just reminding you about how much heat is being lost. This cellular respiration process is amazingly efficient. It, it, it About 38% of the energy stored in glucose and fatty acids actually winds up in ATP. 62% of the energy is lost as heat, and that's what heats up our body, so that's a good thing. The warm-blooded animals, how can we do it? We just do cellular respiration and, and voila, we get a lot of heat energy out. It's a pretty good efficiency. And it's just also reminding us in this slide that we have substrate level phosphorylation, substrate level phosphorylation. We add those ATPs up combined with the ones that were produced by um, chemiosmosis or, or uh, oxidative phosphorylation, we get 32. All right, <clears throat> let's stop there and we'll pick up next time talking about um, glycogenesis and glucogen, gluconeogenesis and so forth and glycogenolysis uh, and I know